Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. May I take this opportunity of welcoming you to King's Hall and to the FETL 2018 lecture. FETL's uh, mission is to strengthen and support the leadership of thinking. Whistleblowers are almost universally hated. They despise, they vilified, they are stigmatized. They're treated terribly badly. It's all about the different ways in which whistleblowers are stigmatized. Whistleblowing, I think, touches on a lot of the sort of secret spaces you find in institutions and organisations. Um, for example, there's a sacred space where the board sits and executives sit with the board. And often whistleblowing um, is something that requires you to walk into a new sacred space um, and intrude on the relationship, which could be a cosy relationship. And that takes a lot of courage. And so how can these sacred spaces be receptive to that sort of intrusion? Whistleblowers get stigmatised in lots of different ways. Firstly, through words, the spoken word, the written word, documents. They get nicknamed and so on and so forth. I think I'd like to get a sense of where the current thinking is around what I'm calling enlightened followership. I think so many things around whistleblowing get cast in the realm of problems. But I think there's something about just how we take up our roles in organisations. So how do we make sense of the role of the follower in the context of leadership when things are good and when things are not so good? So that's what I'm hoping to hear. The general view is that the whistleblower is stigmatised because they re represent somebody different from the organisation, the opposition, the enemy. They stand up in opposition to the, to the organisation. Always you, you come out in the evening to try and stretch your mind, get a new perspective and actually form some new views. So I'm really interested to see what Mark has to say and to reflect on those comments. And what is your role within I'm the Professor of Leadership in Further Education and Skills and consistent with the FETL purpose and mission, I aim to stimulate and to lead thinking about further education and skills is part in the nation's future, in, play, in, in community's future, and supporting prosperity across the nation. I think it's really interesting, given everything that's been happening over the last couple of years, um, to hear about whistleblowing outside of FE and skills, but we can apply it, I think, really quite tightly to, to colleges uh, and across the skill system in Scotland and beyond. So I think talking about whistleblowing seems to be the right time. I think talking about it within colleges and the skills system as to how we can improve those organisations is a really apt time to do it. Freud's idea of projection, which really kind of came first, but the idea is very simply about emotion. I think it brought home to me as a leader of an organisation how we need to ensure that people are in a safe place to bring forward bad news. I think as a, as a leader, you're often looking for success for the organisation to go forward. But of course, we need to learn from things. And of course, not everything goes right. And if you create a culture whereby people can bring in bad news, we can learn from those. And so I think personally, that's something I'll take away from this evening. So I've chosen as my case the Mid Staffordshire National Health Service Trust crisis. It was a case of great magnitude. It was a very, very serious crisis. Between 400 and 1,200 people died unnecessarily. The Guardian, whose building we're in at the moment, said at the time, wrote at the time, this was the biggest scandal in the health service in years, one that has become a byword for dangerously inadequate treatment. I think the lecture focused very clearly on the predicament of the individual whistleblower and the, uh, as the uh, professor said, Mark Stein said, the relatedness of the, the fact of a whistleblower to the, the rest of the population of people trying to get on with their work. And, uh, and I think this focus on how the individual represents a sort of lost image, an idealised image uh, for the rest of people was, was interesting and helpful to focus on. What happened at Mid Staffordshire cannot be put down to funding problems. Now, Nurse Donnelly worked in accident and emergency she started blowing the whistle about a number of different things. But I think the thing that was really most irksome to her was that she and her colleagues were told to lie. For me, um, the, the takeaway, if you like, was that no matter how 
significant or challenging an issue is we've got to uh, allow people to bring issues to us and to bring bad news to us no matter how challenging it is for us or for our organizations or for our people we've got to be open to bad news coming forward to us it's about the loss of the function of knowing of honesty and of integrity if you think about nurse donnelly all the nurses have gone along with this lie they have fabricated data and somebody's standing up and they're saying this is not on. We can't do this anymore. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And the thing that really struck me was how complex and difficult a moral question it is for organisations and how easy in that complexity it is to lose sight of the moral truth or the moral rightness. You know, we think we have, as organisations in the public sector, we have a set of values which is all about public service and doing the right thing. And yet people clearly have lost sight of that. And that, in a way, that's, that's shocking. And how did we let that happen? This evening's lecture made me think about the way in which senior leaders in organisations, whether executive board, chief executive, or, or members of the non-executive board, need to create an environment in which whistleblowers feel comfortable to do that. Partly because that's how senior leaders find things out that they need to know in the organisation, but also more broadly because uh, an environment in which there are instances of whistleblowing is, is in my mind, uh, a vital sign of organisational well-being because it, it gives a sense that the organisation, and particularly senior leaders in it, have created an environment in which truth can be heard. Plenty of food for thought. Lots of opportunities to think about what it means to be an individual within an organisation, what it means to be a leader within an organisation and the importance of integrity. I find your talk very inspiring in terms of the problem that you've um, identified. I, wa I wanted to ask, in, in the mental health sector particularly, the, there may be an additional problem which is that the, the patient group who who is a patient in that setting is already very other and alienated. And some of those processes you identified may have occurred to those individuals already. Does it make it, just as an example, does it make it even more difficult to perhaps improve and reform potentially psychiatric services when it's that much harder to speak and voice some of the difficulties that psychiatric patients face potentially in the psychiatric system. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you, that's very interesting. I, I take that as much as a comment as, as a question. I think you, what you're saying is absolutely right. Of course it complicates it, of course it deepens the, the issue. Um, I'm not an expert on psychiatric services, but I know there are people here who are, so maybe they would like to contribute their thinking on that. But thank you for that. Thank you. At the front here, please. Hi, I'm Jill Westerman. I'm a Fettle trustee and also principal of the Northern College in Barnsley. You talked about whistleblowers as people who would stand up um, and declare their opposition and their truth, often in the face of equal amounts of opposition. I just want to explore, um, I, I think, the nuances, because we've got a long tradition in this country of people standing up in opposition. Um, if you take trade unionists, they're a classic example. They are speaking a the truth. They're very, very principled. There is a lot of opposition to their view. But I'm not sure that that kind of speaking out would count as whistleblowing. The nuance about about really what whose truth and what truth is, and what becomes categorised as serious and untoward, which is what you talked about in terms of whistleblowing. So, in your research, how did you separate out that idea of really strong opposition and valuable opposition and valid opposition from whistleblowing, which is, I think, a different notion. Thank you, that's very interesting. I think, um, of course, there, there's all kinds of ways in which people speak out, you're absolutely right. I think 
my own sense is that what's important to focus on in whistleblowing is cases where there's clearly something untoward, seriously untoward. I think in Zeebrugge it was very clear. And I think in Midstas it was very clear. People were being asked to lie. Um, so those are the kinds of cases I want to focus on. Of course, there's a whole gray area of other cases where it may be much more ambiguous. A trade unionist might be arguing a particular issue and somebody else might be saying, well, no, that's not a whistleblowing. So that there is a gray area, of course, and I guess I'm not really wanting to go down that line. I'm looking at cases where it's pretty clear cut and I could cite many others where it's very clear cut, something either illegal or dangerous or unethical, clearly unethical, unequivocally unethical is going on. That's what I'm looking at. The gentleman just behind Jill, please. Um, same question. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Jonathan Shaw, Policy Connect. Um, you um, used hospitals, and we've just heard a gentleman talk about psychiatric hospitals. Um, and of course, Goffman wrote asylums as well, and um, it was, I thought that was an interesting point, where there is that sort of total institution, and the power and the powerless are very extreme. I just wondered, in terms of thinking about mitigation against, uh, uh, so that people uh, are in a better position to whistleblow, or indeed authorities um, more concerned about acting um, properly and not illegally. Um, do you look at mitigation? Is social media, for example, and the electronic devices all of us hold uh, in, in our hands and our pockets today, is that mitigating uh, against um, um, abusive behaviour? I personally haven't looked at that, but I think there's there's enormous range of literature on these things. We just want to think about the um, uh, Zeebrugge ferry mm -hmm. and trade unionists with, who, who were, you commented that they were writing articles prior mm -hmm. to the accident happening. Mm -hmm. One might imagine, you know, people taking a film now, or at least uh, p uh, authorities being concerned about the prospect of that happening. So I just wonder, with are we living in a society where things are less likely to happen or more likely to happen? That is a very big question. <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer. I think, th frankly, these issues are endemic, so I'm not sure I can really answer that. Sorry, Lewis, would you like to come in? Yeah, I mean, what you put me in, in mind of, Jonathan, is the importance of, uh, if I think at the college sector, the importance of um, <clears throat> good, a good uh, board secretary because very often they pick up things going on around the college or some, uh, some emails and so on being sent. And it's very hard when you're the principal. It's lonely as a principal. It's also lonely as a chair. And that third leg to that, that th the third in the, in, in, in the kind of leadership of the governing body, um, actually with evidence can say there's something disturbing in, uh, in, in students are unhappy or whatever it would be. So paying attention to that kind of um, not quite public declarations, but something in the water that's saying there's something not right here, the students are too unhappy, um, and we have no, but can I draw it to your attention? And very often, I think people in the audience, somebody I know who's uh, got, studied uh, the, the role of clerks to boards, they're a very important kind of objective voice, and with evidence you can say, well, actually there's 500 emails. That, you know, always be suspicious of them as well. But it needs more than just a chair of a board or the chief executive or the principal to pay attention to that rather different kind of information coming through. Thank you. So the gentleman. Um, uh, <clears throat> My name's Seb Schmoller. I'm chair of the governing body at the Sheffield College. And my question is really about whether you're describing a subset of whistleblowing situations in which the organization being whistleblowed does nothing and then people start to become stigmatized and it kind of it goes completely to pieces whereas 
alongside that, there are many other circumstances where people bravely call out what's going on and it gets sorted out. And I'm a bit nervous that the focus of your talk gives us to believe that the dominant form in which whistleblowing happens is the mid-staffs context situation, that that's an example, whereas really that's a kind of how things can really go wrong if you don't have proper processes in place. Uh, just as a side point, in relation to the Herald of Free Enterprise, you said there was whistleblowing, but was there stigmatization of the people who were calling Townsend Thorison out before the disaster, or was there just evidence that people knew about the problem and nothing was done about it? No, it's a very interesting uh, point you make and a very interesting set of issues. Um, I'm not sure I can comment much more on Zeebrugger, but what I, what I would say is that having looked at the literature and what, what we know about this is that there are so many cases where, which are similar to the Midstas one. And as I say, in finance, in um, industrial disasters, in transport disasters, it's very much the same pattern. And what whistle, if you read the literature on whistleblowers or you talk to them, what they will tell you is that their lives are made in absolute misery. It's kind of career suicide to blow the whistle in many organizations. They, people get stigmatized, they get vilified, and they are forced to leave or else they get thrown out. So, of course, there are cases, you're absolutely right, there are cases where these things do get sorted out. People are heard and these things are addressed. What worries me is that there's so many other cases, a bit like the Midstaffs one, in so many organizations, and I think those are the ones we need to be concerned about. Thank you. Could we do the gentleman here and then the gentleman, oops, sorry, the gentleman two back, please. Good evening. <coughs> My name's Ian Foxley. I'm the whistleblower out of Saudi Arabia on corruption in defense contracts, currently under investigation. I'm also the founding chairman of Whistleblowers UK, the support organization for whistleblowers. Um, I've also just finished a master's looking at overcoming stigma, applying whistleblowers' experience to human rights defenders. You gave us a very interesting view of why you, society, hate us, the whistleblower. And it was, it was insightful, believe me. Um, looking at it from the point of view of Goffman, Goffman gave the view of society as a group of people who want to cooperate with one another, who form groups together, and, and describe the norms of that society, and therefore describe what is known as the normal, as he puts it. And those who don't conform to those norms are the abnormal. And what we have is what I call the whistleblower paradox, where those within the normal remember the norms and remind the normals of what they should be doing and are decried as abnormal for so doing. And that's an utter paradox. And I think what we're looking at is the, the abnormals at the bottom end of the scale. And if I could be so bold as to say that the whistleblowers are at the other end of the scale, they are what I would define as the supranormal those who are the conscience of society, those who remember what they should be doing, and for one reason or another, cannot stand not to see the good word spoken, the fact that you know, something is going wrong and they have to speak out about it, and are decried for it. And I think the bigger problem is more a cultural problem. It's, a, it's the culture of society that forgets that if you smack the child for coming and telling you what's going wrong, the other children won't come and tell you what's going wrong. If you reward the child and say, well done, and give it a hug and a smile for telling you what's going wrong, that it's being abused, that it's being bullied, then other children will see what's happening and will come forward. And we have a cultural problem in this country on how we view, how we talk about whistleblowers and how we respect them or even how we I hate to say the word reward them, but we, we, we incentivize others by the way that we treat whistleblowers. Mm. And that's what we fundamentally have to turn around in this country at the moment. So thank you for your view on, on why we are hated, 
But I think the next step is, and what are we going to do about it? Over to you. Well, I, th I, th I think you've said it all. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. A gentleman here. No, no, gentleman there. James Kirk from the Social Market Foundation. I'd just like to pick up a little bit on actually that, that word culture um, and the point you made earlier when you talked about your, your, your reading of the literature and comparative cases. I'm just curious to know uh, where have you seen, I'm hoping you have seen somewhere, where have you seen examples of organisations where a, a culture has been successfully developed that lowers that barrier of stigmatization where, where successful organizations bring about a culture where whistleblowing is not easy but easier. Uh, and maybe if I can uh, try and draw Ruth into this, um, where, where does the, where's the role of leadership in developing that culture? Is that, does it have to be top down or does, that, does it come more widely? Well, there's a lot of research and development work on creating speak-up arrangements for whistleblowers and trying to develop a culture where that is possible and legitimate. And there are lots of different, there's no consensus about how best to do this. There are anonymized speak-up arrangements, which you have in the airline industry and in America and the financial services industry, which can be very effective in many ways, but has some drawbacks. And then there, you know, the other issue is having internal people in the organization who are appointed to be at the receiving end of these kinds of concerns. So there's lots of work in that area. I can't, I can't cite any one organization where I think that's happened perfectly, but there's certainly a lot of work going on. Actually, it's one of the reasons why we have the lecture. The people I've worked with, uh, um, colleagues, where I have seen them not be frightened of bad news, but see it as a gift to the organisation is very helpful. And I think what I noticed most about those colleagues was that they saw themselves as leading the learning of their staff as well. So it wasn't about, uh, and uh, the pressure on many colleagues I know is to kind of make it right. The, the, the thing about our sector, um, being funded annually, having enormous compliance regimes. Sometimes it's just easier to kind of work, pull together to make things safe. I really felt that when we heard about the hospital. But there's something about the, the leader being an example to say, thank you for the bad news. You know, let's, let's see what that means in the organisation. I think that my experience as a younger principal was with more of it then, but there was less scrutiny and less goldfish bowl kind of living. And the price that's paid for that is enormously, uh, enormously high. Um, that's why FETL exists, is to say, actually, can we think of other ways of receiving good news and bad news and work together, work with other colleagues, giving other colleagues the chance to come in and explore, explore issues in our own organisations. I have colleagues in the audience, they, and I know some of them, actually behave like that, work like that. So the principal in college is the chief exec who leads learning for the institution and in the organisation, I think, is one of the ways that I have most hope for. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the lady at the back, the gentleman there, and then the lady here in green, please. Hi. My name is uh, Bernie Rochford. I'm an ex-clinical commissioner. Um, I'm saying gex because I was a whistleblower and uh, I was threatened, bullied, intimidated, lost my uh, home, my finances, my health, uh, the sort of story that you're telling there. Where I'm heading with this is whether you can uh, talk a bit about willful blindness. In my case, I was bullied and threatened at work and staff colluded uh, against me, just as you're dictating there. My case went into uh, the Sir Francis report, page 55, it's the diagram. I went through 47 layers of NHS management bodies, um, organisations, and people just colluded at that level and turned a blind eye to what's going on. December, by December 2017, my case has gone through 87 layers of NHS bodies, organisations, management, I didn't even know that many existed. So there is the collusion uh, against and the bullying against the whistleblower. 
uh, within their organisation, but once you take it outside, what is the psychology behind the willful blindness? People actually not wanting to, to see. Uh, just as in the Midstaff's case where the hospital was applying for foundation status, I worked for a primary care, I was a commissioner, and the primary care trust was applying for CCG status. So if NHS England, uh, when I approached them, they couldn't do anything about it because they've already approved them for CCG status. So there would be a loss of faith uh, and face for the other organisations. But I think there is something about the Sir Francis report now, the focus is on speaking up. But actually, before people can speak up, they've actually got to see what's going on. So it's the willful blindness and not seeing. I'd be interested if you could comment on that. Well, thank you. That, that's very interesting and, and you know, obviously deeply, deeply upsetting that you've had to go through all of that. Um, it, as I understand it, it's something about the in-group, you know, that you, there's something about organizational culture in general, it's not to say always, but often it's the case. You want to be part of the group. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to be different. And if somebody's standing out from the crowd, they are kind of ousted, they're stigmatized. So, so there is a kind of willful blindness. People have a sense that something's going on, but they don't want to look at it. They don't want to name it. They don't want to touch it. It's kind of toxic. And um, they kind of, it's just something about wanting to be part of the group. We desperately want to be, we kind of group animals and to risk being the outsider or joining an outsider is scary. Thank you. Yes, uh, Ian Mackay, I'm a, a director and involved in a number of public sector bodies and most recently as chair at Edinburgh College, which brings me into connection with FETO. I think the last speaker in particular reminds us of just how awful, and from a personal point of view, how damaging a lot of the, the situations which you've been describing are. And I think it's very helpful this evening to have that framework that you've put uh, to us. But I wanted to take it into a slightly different direction, and Ruth might have a view on this too. I also happen to be part of the leadership of the Institute of Directors, and uh, anyone that's been reading the newspapers in the last wee while will know that I feel pretty alienated from the whole human race at this moment yeah. in time. Mm. But because, you know, we've been dealing with something which is very much about whistleblowing and very much affecting individuals' lives. But by and large, when it comes into employment, whistleblowing has, of course, as a, an individual and social construct, has then been put into that whole framework of employment law and into you know, systems and processes which are then supposed to deal with that. My interest here is what happens when that moves out of there's been a committee and this is a committee decision into governance, into those of us who are there to try and look after, I think what Ruth was describing as the sort of conscience and the sort of way of looking, you know, the, that oversight of an entity and that sort of sense of what is right and what is wrong of that entity, which I think very much comes into the boardroom, not just of a college, but indeed of a, of a company or a third sector body and so on. Is there something in what you've been looking at which gives us some way in which those of us who are there sitting around that boardroom should be better armed and better ready to be able to deal with the consequences of, of whistleblowing, not just as setting up systems, but looking at the well-being of the, the whole organisation as a whole? I don't think it's a response, but I, I want to make a comment. You, you, and James's question made me think the same thing. Uh, actually, for me, it all went wrong, as it often does, at the minute procedures and uh, that kind of distancing happened in organisations. I think it was a theft of judgment. So it was no longer me telling my gaffer what I thought. It was really, but it went straight into procedures. The loss of the humanity in the organisation started to happen then. And it's a defence against all sorts of things that I think is really quite tough in modern organisational life. Um, uh, also, all the, the kind of accountabilities that are there. So I'm, I, I think I'd fight for a, the terrain I would fight for would be to say, can we just pause before it goes there? Um, uh, certainly superiors taking people into procedures 
um, closes off all sorts of learning and any kind of appreciative inquiry about why that's happening. And that really worries me. Um, I've passed it to procedures, HR are dealing with it. It's an act of Pontius Pilate, in my view, from leadership, and it shouldn't be allowed. Sorry. Oh, sorry. What several people have been talking about, including uh, you, Ruth, in the, in the last thing, has made me think about upside-down priorities. So the unthinkable that a health trust would put targets or foundation trust status ahead of patient well-being, it's a complete inversion. But in a way, it's almost easier to understand than the Zeebrucker story. So where, you know, the hubris of the beautiful new ferry that couldn't be challenged or you know, where safety first would seem to be a, a fundamental value in any kind of transportation organization. So we could go th through all this. And then as the lady was talking about the ghastly experiences she'd been through, I was thinking about how we, as a society, might be colluding in a reward and punishment system of the leaders. So what happens to mid-staffs if they don't lie about the t you know, we know that kind of corruption is absolutely rife. I have yet to work with an NHS trust that doesn't have a policy that protects whistleblowers. It's eons from the reality, but they all have them in, in place. So there's something about rewarding the upside down priorities that I'm finding myself quite curious about and preoccupied with. No? Just to agree. The gentleman here and then the lady just along. Gabby. Yeah. So, sorry, the gentleman first, please. Uh, thank you. Um, Tom Lloyd, I'm the current chairman of uh, Whistleblowers UK, having taken over from my friend over there. Um, I haven't got that much time uh, that I would like to expand on you know, all of the problems associated with whistleblowers, but certainly uh, we see um, you know, day after day people coming, coming to our organisation uh, in a great deal of <coughs> distress as a result of the way they've been treated, and that's, that's clear. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk about culture and, and learning organizations and these are all things that should be done whistleblowers should be listened to because they're pointing out something that's going wrong and the organization should learn from it and matthew side's written a book actually about that which is very interesting um there is an organization that uh, does have very good um, speak up arrangements which is the it's a uk uh, nuclear decommissioning authority and of course the characteristic there is if you get it wrong you blow yourselves up and half the country so they tend to be rather good rather like the airline industry but that's just to answer a particular point that was made what's interesting is that whistleblowers don't say i'm going to be a whistleblower they say i want to point out something that's gone wrong hmm. and obviously people are listened to as the other person was talking about but far too many aren't so we've been thinking about how do you actually deal with this and coincidentally this year is the 20th anniversary of of PEDA, which is a public um, uh, interest disclosure act. But this is an act that actually has a particular defect. What it does is it defines whistleblowing in the way that you've said, Professor, which is that it has to be serious wrongdoing. It has to be um, believed to be that, reasonably believed to be that, by the whistleblower. Um, and the crucial point is, is that if they suffer detriment as a result, then they have some recourse but the recourse is normally to employment tribunals, so basically the situation doesn't work. So um, I want to make one point, which is about um, your view, maybe others' view, others' view, view, that at the moment there is no personal responsibility for causing detriment to whistleblowers. Organisations take it on, and they pay out, if you like, um, inadequately normally, and after fighting, perhaps for the reasons that you've said, and we think that there should be criminal sanctions for people who cause detriment to whistleblowers when you have sufficient points to prove. And clearly that's, that's quite easy to be done. I want to make another point, if I may, which is I'm not arguing against your theory. 
about why whistleblowers receive such bad treatment, but if you like adding to it, because in our experience, quite often a whistleblower is simply pointing out something which is often, say in banking, we've got a number of these cases, effectively a criminal act. So the motivation is simply to get rid of the whistleblower so they can't turn these people in. And that, that I think, could be very strong motivation, which maybe is a, sometimes a more proximate reason for the uh, persecution of the whistleblower than your theory. I'm not arguing against your theory because I don't think I can um, with the knowledge I have, but I think there's some, in some ways, maybe a simpler explanation that you just don't want this person ratting on the thing that you've done wrong. Thank you. Thank you. The lady just here. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for a great paper. I, I wanted to go back to the points that were made, one about willful blindness and the other about what do we do about whistleblowing. And I was thinking about maybe we need to think, as, as you have, but I had some other thoughts about why is it that people we collude with some terrible practice. And when you talked about Julie Bailey and what happened to her, my fantasy, I don't, I don't think you said this, but my fantasy was that the attacks on her weren't just from the hospital staff or the NHS Trust, but were from the local community. And then I was thinking that as members of the local community, perhaps it felt absolutely unbearable to know that the place that you were so dependent on your local hospital where you took your mother when she was dying, when you go when you're dying, whatever, you know, that we're totally dependent on. It's completely unbearable to know, to face the truth about it, that it's so appalling. This is the willful blindness bit. So the rage that it causes to be confronted with that truth, and I think that is the blindness bit, that we ordinarily find it so hard to really face truth and reality. And that's why, that's one reason for collusion. But the other thing I was thinking about was sitting with a, an organisation that I'm consulting to, sorry, I should have said Gabriella Brown working well, so I consult to organisations. <laughs> um, sitting with an organisation I'm consulting to at the moment, and in the atmosphere, and it's a new client, uh, so it's my fourth time meeting them, and in the atmosphere I started to feel very confused and very helpless. I didn't know what the hell was going on, and I'm expected to make wise comments. Um, and it made me think that there's also something so mad-making about some people saying, you've got to lie, we're the ones in authority, we're the good people here and we're telling you to lie, and yet you know it's a terrible thing to do. And it can drive you fairly bonkers, actually, having that complete split. And maybe that's also another reason why we collude and we're willfully blind. Thank you. Comment? Gentlemen, thank you. Hi. Um, I was intrigued by your title. Um, whistleblowing the loss of the good self. If I'd been giving the lecture, I would have called it whistleblowing the loss of the good object. Because from the point of view of the whistleblower, it's the good object that suddenly becomes bad and becomes the persecutor. Um, and I've, I'm a retired GP, Steve Nicholas, and I think there's a lot of um, really kind of virtue signaling at the moment. You know, the NHS is a learning, no blame organization but actually people's experience is that the NHS is not a no-blame situation as the doctor from Birmingham would testify at the moment. And one of my concerns is that actually things which are very good, which are appraisal and reflection and helping people to work on resilience within a difficult system, actually help to locate the pathology within you rather than within the organisation. Um, so I think that actually to become a whistleblower, you actually have to fundamentally change your view of the good organisation 
and actually recognize that in many ways it's actually turned. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry, one last quick question, <laughs> and then I'm afraid we'll have to close. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's a very, very relevant point. I wanted to connect to a point that was made about purpose um, before. I'm Anthony Painter, I'm director of the Action and Research Centre at the RSA. Um, I directed a independent review into the Police Federation a few years back and reflecting on Zabrugga and mid South, and if you remember it was after Plebgate and the events that followed on from there. And what was quite clear is that what you're seeing is a series of organisations that had lost sight of their, their purpose, not what they're there for but who they're there for. Um, Townsend Torrenson is there for the passengers, mid staffs for the patients, the Police Federation for the police and by extension and the public. And what we found very easy was to craft a set of sort of structures and ethical codes about how the Police Federation might want to behave. But we struggled far more to find mechanisms by which you could promote, reinforce, celebrate, encourage authentic leadership at every point of the organisation um, and beyond. I'd be interested to hear some reflections um, on that question of how we can uh, nurture authentic leadership. Because if you're able to do that, then hopefully you won't get to a point where a whistleblower is necessary, because by that point, it's way, way, way too late. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we have come to the end of our question and answer session. We have run out of time. May I take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of all of my colleagues at FETL for, this, for attending this very timely lecture, which I hope you found both stimulating and challenging. With all that's going on in the world at this time, Professor Stein's lecture reinforces in all of us that need and strength of character to be that good self and to see it in others. I ask you kindly to show your appreciation for Professor Mark Stein and for Dame Ruth Silver, who has also contributed to this evening. Can I have the last word? Or oh, the second last word? No, I'm not finished yet. All right, then. <laughs> Two glass regions in a stage is never a good idea. Before beginning your journey home, uh, and I have the delightful task before Ruth of inviting you to join us for some refreshments back up in the battle room when Ruth is finished, if you would care to make your way there. Thank you very much indeed. You may. <laughs> Let me just say that this has been filmed tonight and it will be on the Fettle website. And Mark has agreed to be available for Fettel to organise a webinar with him. So we hope maybe in about a month's time we'll be able to write to you all and saying the webinar will take place where after a month's reflection you will have the chance to uh, con converse with Mark further. So, uh, and that actually I know that some of the great work from Fettel is what people produce for us to take to the world. People use in their organisations, I'm thinking of working well, they will take that to their staff and senior leadership team and work with what's being passed through. So let me, uh, let me just say that, uh, Chair, with, uh, and thank you very much, um, that actually watch out for the, uh, the televised version, of the televised film version of this and the webinar, and please take uh, part. There will be a publication as well of Mark's lecture. And yet we gift before you leave is we have uh, for everybody uh, the kind of concept paper that FETO works with as it tries to uh, influence change systems and uh, better footprints. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody.